Lord, we pray that you will open the eyes of our hearts, that we may see and know and understand the great love that you have for us, the freedom that you have won for us from sin and guilt through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and his death for us, and that uh, we may be strengthened in our daily walk with you. Amen. Amen. If the resurrection of Jesus is true, then it changes everything. In church I used to attend in Sheffield, I knew a couple there and the husband was a committed Christian and uh, his wife um, had resisted um, for many years. But then on Easter Sunday, three years ago, it suddenly occurred to her um, that if the resurrection was true, then everything else, for all her doubts and all the things she was uncertain about, really had got to be seen in that light. And if the resurrection is true, it changes everything and it changes me and it changes you. It can never simply be just a fact from history. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then uh, it means that his sacrifice upon the cross for our sin was real and effective. It means that he was who he said he was. It means that there is the reality of heaven and that Christ will come again at the end of human history. Nothing could be more important than the truth and the reality of the resurrection. And so I find it very interesting that the gospel writers do not go off into some kind of abstract theology or attempting to philosophize. Um, what they focus on are the stories of ordinary people as they're confronted with this amazing event. So we can speak of um, skeptical Thomas, who I think he's the nearest person I see in the Bible to an Englishman um, <laughs> who, who won't believe anything until he sees it um, and is devoted to Jesus but in a slightly gloomy sort of way. Um, you may remember in John 11 when they're about to go to Bethany, where people have been trying to kill Jesus, and Jesus is going to visit because Lazarus is, is, um, is ill, in fact he's dead, and Thomas says, well, let's go with him and die also. <laughs> um, these people come off the page to us, don't they? And then there's Mary, Mary Magdalene at the tomb, um, heartbroken because she is because Jesus, she thinks, is not only dead, but also even his body has been stolen, has been taken away. And she has to hear him speak her name before she could recognize him. And then we have this unnamed couple on the Emmaus Road, uh, two unknown disciples who recover a hope that they thought was gone forever. But again, they do not recognize Jesus straight away. But afterwards they say, were not our hearts burning within us while he taught with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And I think that those two <coughs> on the road to Emmaus are perhaps the easiest for us to identify with. Why is it that they're not actually given names? We've got no, there's been lots of speculation, but we really do not know who they were. But I think that makes it easier for us to imagine ourselves on that Emmaus road with Jesus. There they are um, on an apparently fairly pointless journey um, late in the afternoon, trying to come to terms with how something which was so full of promise and hope should end in such a shocking and brutal way. 
such a bleak end to their great hopes of the one they thought was the Messiah. And it's good that we should be able to identify with them because we all find at some point in our lives that great hopes that we've had don't materialize or apparently don't materialize. And you may be here this morning with perhaps a sense of wistfulness, wishing perhaps that you could hear Jesus in the same way as those two on the road to Emmaus and have that same hope of resurrection, of eternal life, of, <clears throat> of heaven, of a life that goes beyond this one as this one draws to an end. Or it may be you have a sense of wistfulness because human hopes have not materialized. And even those that have are one day going to be brought to an end by our frailty and mortality. We need something more solid. We need lasting hope. We need a confidence in the joy of our heavenly home. And so Jesus drew alongside these two ordinary disciples and he brings them comfort and hope. And he does the same today, but not now through his physical presence. Um, but through the Gospels and the whole of the Bible, which have the living, risen Jesus at their centre. Now, Luke tells us in verse 16 that the disciples were actually prevented from recognising Jesus. Now, why would that have been? Well, think of their words after Jesus left them. They exclaimed, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Jesus opened the scriptures to them. Now, imagine what would have happened if they had recognised him instantly. They would have been so overjoyed, so stunned by this amazing fact that they probably wouldn't have heard a word he'd said after that. Um, you know, in, imagine if you've been separated from somebody you love for a long time. Um, you know, you, you just overwhelmingly want to just be together and enjoy their presence. And you may not be taking a lot of notice of what they're saying about the flight or the journey. You, you know, you're just so delighted to be with them. And it's only speculation on my part, but I think the reason why they didn't recognize Jesus straight away was because Jesus wanted them to hear and he wanted them to listen. And certainly the point of that walk was to open the scriptures to them. And what Jesus said to them on that walk as a result would have been imprinted on their hearts and minds forever. And what Jesus does is to gradually unfold the scripture. Moses and the prophets, um, as Luke refers to them in verse 27, is simply a way of saying the whole of the Old Testament. So Jesus is giving them a kind of, they're, they're walking to Emmaus, but they're also having a walk through the Bible, which at, for that stage, at that stage for them, of course, was our Old Testament. And what, he's, what Jesus is doing is bringing to them a dawning awareness of restored hope. Their hearts are burning within them because Jesus is touching on that deepest need and the light's beginning to dawn and they're beginning to see that actually it wasn't, uh, Jesus' death wasn't just a kind of futile, um, accidental, tragic end, but it's actually part of the purposes of God. Um, and Luke says that Jesus showed them how the Messiah must suffer 
So their understanding of a Messiah would probably have been one of, of glory, but they'd missed the suffering. And now they're beginning to realize that, that this is not the end of the story. So they needed to hear before they could come to see. And that's a great encouragement to us because none of us today <clears throat> can actually see Jesus, but we can hear him through the scriptures and through the, the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit who expands and open those scriptures to our heart. And doesn't this underline for us how important it is that we um, fully uh, accept and stand by the authority of the Bible in the church? Um, and this has always been a struggle in the church. And it's not because we believe the Bible in some extremely literist, literalistic way, um, but it's because Christian faith is not something we make up, it's something God reveals. And it's something we could never make up because it's far richer and more wonderful than anything that we could dream up. And the Bible tells us, if you like, the unfolding story of how God in his love reaches out to us in his tenderness and his goodness that it's his heart's desire, as we read in the Old Testament reading from Zephaniah, that he rejoices over us. But you could say the whole Bible is, is in a sense, um, a love story. How God um, rescues and retrieves fallen men and women and brings them back to himself. Um, that authority and truth of God's word, though, is uh, always under challenge in various ways. We have a contemporary challenge in the church, uh, particularly in the Anglican Church um, and the Church of England, um, because of the tendency of the churches of, in, in, of the global north to compromise with um, ideologies that have really only grown up over the last generation or so about marriage and gender and sexuality um, which are completely <coughs> contrary to the teaching of the bible and ultimately to human flourishing and for some there's a price to be paid for that commitment and faithfulness to the revealed word of god and i know you have experienced that as a congregation. I've experienced that in my own life. Um, but this is going to be the pattern of the church throughout all uh, periods. And it was the rediscovery of the power and truth of God's word that uh, triggered off the reformation of the 16th century. The, Roman, the medieval Roman Catholic Church had developed a very complex system of penance. It was a bit like a kind of industry for souls. And um, so the, the Christian life became something you know, like accumulating um, merit. And Martin Luther was a very conscientious monk and he had a, a deep crisis over this. He was so aware of the holiness of God and of his own shortcomings and sinfulness and failure. Um, but one day in 1519, he was um, reading Romans chapter one, verse 17, which has a, a quote from Haggai from the Old Testament, um, that the, the righteous shall live by faith. And he felt oppressed by this because he thought, how can I think of myself as righteous? You know, and. I expect you've probably caught yourself doing this, haven't you? You know, that you, you, you feel you're doing really well, uh, and then you realize you're actually, uh, you need to be a bit more humble, and it's difficult, you know. We can get caught up in all sorts of things within ourselves. 
But for Luther, this was a really profound existential <coughs> crisis. But then it was a, a, like a road to Emmaus experience for Luther that he suddenly realized that the righteousness that the Apostle Paul talks about is not something <clears throat> that we build up like money in the bank, but it's sheer gift. Um, and Paul would later, later writes in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that was the point of the cross, wasn't it? That the ransom is paid, the price is paid, that God's judgment is satisfied, that we are set free from our sins to become children of God. And Luther wrote, all at once I felt that I had been born again and entered into paradise itself through open gates. Immediately I saw the whole of scripture in a different light. Well, that's like the Emmaus Road. Those two disciples on the Emmaus Road suddenly saw <coughs> scripture in a different light, something that they'd been familiar with for many years, and yet they hadn't actually realized the glorious, wonderful truth at its heart. It may be that there are perhaps some of you here this morning who have been very familiar with Christian things and with the Bible or even church, and yet that fundamental, wonderful, glorious truth of the one who died for you has still not settled in your heart. So may it be so this morning that you, like those two on the road to Emmaus, hear Jesus speaking to you. I met um, recently the deputy principal of a theological college based in Wales, and he was telling me that they have um, a connection with a church in Korea. I thought this was really rather unusual to have that kind of link. But he said that it went back to um, a, a Welsh missionary of the 19th century, um, a man called Robert German Thomas. And he was the first Protestant missionary to Korea, um, but his career from a human point of view ended badly, in fact very badly, because in 1866, even before the mission had got underway, um, he, was, he was beheaded. He was the first Protestant martyr. But just before he died, he gave his Bible to his executioner. <coughs> and, the, 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 and it was written in Korean. And this chap had a strange taste in wallpaper. So he decided to take the Bible apart and paste it on the wall. Um, but of course then he ended up reading it and because he read it he ended up becoming a Christian and because he became a Christian others became Christians and that was really the beginning of really the, the beginning of the Christian church in Korea which now in South Korea is very uh, a very strong vibrant Christian church. I think that's a wonderful example of the power of, of God. Through that, through the, the dead missionaries, Bible wallpaper, many Koreans came to know and to follow the Lord Jesus. So let me conclude. Um, Robert Thomas' life, um, in a way, followed the same pattern as Jesus. Um, he died um, as a young man. His life was one of suffering and yet also of enormous fruitfulness that he did not live, at least on this side of eternity, to see. He suffered, but not in a futile or pointless way. And his life bore great fruit because of his death. And 
So I think it's uh, wonderful that along with our uh, re uh, our uh, reading from Luke's Gospel this morning, um, we had those words from Zephaniah, which I've already referred to. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Jesus' resurrection shows that the judgment has been taken away, that the death of Jesus really did achieve our forgiveness and bring new life. Hope is indeed restored. And so I want to encourage you today in the ordinariness of our lives to embrace and expect the presence of the extraordinary presence of the Lord Jesus through his spirit. And that, uh, in some ways, ordinary thing, the Bible, to which we are so familiar. Let's go to that every day, not just on Sundays, and have that um, walk, as it were, with Jesus, who continually opens our eyes to his love and truth and power and presence. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his mighty resurrection, for his tenderness and his mercy towards us who are so often slow to believe and to trust. And Lord, we pray that uh, continually you would, by your Holy Spirit, open the scriptures to us, build us up in our faith, and may we uh, ever more strongly embrace that sure and certain hope that you've given us through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Lord, we praise you that evil and death are defeated and that we have an indestructible hope as we put our trust in him. Amen. Amen.